Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary star who exemplifies the meaning of the phrase triple threat because she dances, acts, and sings with equal perfection. She's regarded internationally as one of Broadway's foremost singing and dancing leading ladies who will forever be remembered and adored for creating the iconic role of Cassie in a chorus line earning her a Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical, as well as a Drama Desk Award and a Theatre World Special Award. She's also starred on Broadway and How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, The Education of Hyman Kaplan, On the Town, Promises, Promises, Company, The Visit, State Fair, for which she won the Fred Astaire Award for Best Female Dancer and a Drama Desk Award nomination, and Sondheim, a musical tribute, which she also choreographed. She's starred in numerous musical productions throughout the country and in London's West End, including Follies, Annie Get Your Gun, Mac and Mabel, Gypsy, Can Can, Pajama Game, and many more. She's appeared in many TV shows, including HBO specials, The Tonight Show, Fame, Cheers, Family Ties, and who can ever forget her as Amanda Harris in Dark Shadows. And when she's not busy choreographing a production, she frequently performs in concert with symphony orchestras and on cabaret stages all over the country. She was one of the stars in Four Girls Four, a wonderful concert series with Andrea McCardle, Faith Prince and Maureen McGovern. And if that weren't enough, she wrote a poignant, intensely personal and compelling memoir entitled Time Steps, My Musical Comedy Life, which I just could not put down. I am delighted to welcome the fabulous Donna McKechnie to our show. Donna, thank you so much for being here. Oh, that's so lovely, Harvey. Thank you. What an intro. I forgot I did so many things. <laughs> As you know, Donna, we filmed this show in Toronto, and I was delighted to learn that when you were 12 years old, you came to Toronto for three weeks to study with the National Ballet of Canada. So that's we right. Canadians are very proud that we had a small role to play in your success. It was a major role for me, my young, my impressionistic mind and my imagination. I, it, it really secured my, my passion for dance and for ballet because that's a great school. I just loved it. Well, Donna, this is what you wrote about your perspective as a young dancer in Royal Oak, Michigan. You said, I always approached dancing instinctively as an actress. The music always gave me a storyline or an image for me to connect with, and then I could interpret the music and create my own world. Through the choreography, I could make the character come to life as well as enjoy the athleticism and technical feats of dancing. Donna, has this always been your approach to dancing? Well, I mean, it, it, it was my beginning, you know, and it, it, it stayed with me. I guess it's inherent and I don't know how else to explain it. You know, dancers always have a hard time with description of feelings because so much goes in to the, another kind of language and which reminds me of what, you know, when we all sat around and Michael Bennett said to us, okay, tell us what it's like to be a dancer in show business today. And it was so hard for dancers. They're never asked to speak about it. So to have a, you know, so to find the, the, the right words has always been kind of a challenge. Only when I talk about dance, I do talk a lot. So only when I talk about dancing, because it, it goes to another place. But I love the way you read that description. I, and I haven't read that, but I, that feels very true to me. Although you started out studying ballet and you were actually offered the opportunity to study with the American Ballet Theater, you refused and started yeah. studying jazz and modern dance because you said it satisfied you emotionally much more than ballet. And, when physically, is and physically too, yeah. 
when did you fall in love with musical theater and see it as a serious art form? Well, when uh, I got my first Broadway show, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. And, you know, back then, ballet dancers were kind of defensive about you know, other forms of dance, I guess, because ballet is so hard and a little snooty, you know, looking down on, on what musical theater was then or in terms of the, our perception. But when I got my first job and I saw all these brilliant people, starting with Abe Burroughs and Frank Lesser and Cy Fuhr and Ernie Martin, the producers who had done Guys and Dolls and so many great shows, and all of these wonderful storytellers, these actors and singers put a show together. I just, I, it was like going to university and I went, oh, I'm in awe of these people. And if I really learn how to act and sing, maybe I can have a life in this, in theater that's longer than a dancer's life, perhaps. Because even I knew then that a dancer's life in ballet is very short lived, you know. But also beyond that, I just loved that whole concept of working together in a room, solving problems, being challenged with making it a seamless, you know, from text to, to music to dance was just a, enthralling for me. Well, as you mentioned, your very first Broadway show was How to Succeed in Business, choreographed by Bob Fosse. And Gwen yes. Verdon was the dance captain who was a role oh. model and a mentor for yes. you. You described Bob Fosse as brusque and intimidating at times and a demanding taskmaster. But Donna, he must have loved you because in 1987, he invited you to star in his very last production, a national tour of Sweet Charity, and you got a Helen Hayes Award nomination, correct? Yes, yeah, it was, it was great. It was a great circle in, in life to come around 25 years later and be with them again. Of course, I have to tell you, Gwen Burden was a great star even then. She wasn't like, <laughs> I don't want anyone to get the impression that she was, a, a, you know, his assistant. But she loved doing that. And she was between starring in shows, I think. But she loved working. She worked with Jack Cole that way. And yeah. Now, you've said many times that dancers in the chorus of a Broadway show are treated like second class citizens. And that was why you decided never again to be in the chorus after How to Succeed in Business. You even turned down Bob Fosse's invitation to be in the chorus of Sweet Charity on Broadway. So yeah. the obvious yeah. question yeah. here is, <laughs> why do you think chorus dancers are poorly treated and disrespected within the Broadway community? But it's different now. Let me tell you. It's a whole different business now. And, and don't forget, I was like 20 years old. And I, you know, I remember this came up in discussions when Priscilla Lopez, when it got into the, uh, the show of A Chorus Line, where she says, I always put a time limit if I'm not a star by 20, you know. So the, the, the concepts then were very different about career building. And right now, there are so many brilliant triple threats on Broadway in the ensemble, and it's just a big deal to get a Broadway show. In other words, to work from show to show with different directors and choreographers. It's not, it's not perceived the same way, and it shouldn't be. I was very naive. I mean, when I think back, I do get a little embarrassed because when Bob Fosse calls you, how could you say no to him? And also it's silly because there is no chorus in a Bob Fosse show. It's all ensemble. He handpicks every dancer and it's just a, a great thing to be able to work with him. But I said no twice. Um, thank God he called me 25 years later so I could say yes. Yeah, that is wonderful. Now, as we all know, the greatest single influence in your career was undoubtedly Michael Bennett, whom you met when you were a dancer on Hullabaloo. He was the choreographer yeah. in Promises, Promises and Company. And of course, he wrote, directed and choreographed a chorus line, which is widely considered to be the perfect musical. Your book really helps us understand Michael Bennett, not only as a human being, but as a Broadway creator. You wrote that he had two strategies in getting people to do what he wanted divide and conquer, and seduce and abandon. What did you mean by that? Well, it was, well, divide and conquer. He, and I think it was uh, from the school of, of Jerome Robbins and Jack Cole, you know, it's like to have a control, 
it's a controlled thing. I never always agreed with it, but I like the fact that he left me alone pretty much because he was trying to channel all of his ideas and control this story about, and he wanted it to be truthful and authentic. So, you know, sometimes people can, uh, you know, point an accusatory finger at the method school. So basically it's, it's, it's a great thing, but if you take it too far, do you know what I mean? He was just trying to enable some of the dancers without training, I mean, for her acting training, to find their, their, their more uh, what's, aggressive. Their truth. Feeling. Their truth. Even if their reaction to him, if he wanted to get something out of them, he would just, you know, challenge them in certain ways. And it wasn't, it was just very confusing for me. I, uh, I, I loved his direction so much. And I, the fact that he left me alone had a lot to do with the fact that I was playing a character that was alienated from the group. So that was his process with me, I think. I mean, I just assumed that, but I was very happy that he trusted me enough to let me develop it in my own way. Well, Michael Bennett had this to say about you in an interview in Dance Magazine. He said, Donna is the most beautiful dancer I've ever seen. She's an expressive lyric actress. I've seen people be cute or sexy, but Donna has it all. She learns incredibly fast, has amazing objectivity, and works almost like a collaborator. Donna, that is quite a compliment coming yeah, from him. Yeah, great. No, it's just, uh, I remember reading that. I think I fainted. Um, <laughs> but it's all in turn, though. You know, I learned from the best. Michael had quite a following, even when he was dancing in the chorus of shows people saw his greatness even then his his maybe if, if not his complete greatness but his determination to do something really good uh, in theater so i he's i may I, i've said this before he spoiled me for a lot of director choreographers because he did allow collaboration not just for me but with everyone he worked with he love talent in people. So he wanted you to bring everything you, you could to the part or, or the piece. It's well known that you were married to Michael Bennett and much has been written about his sexual identity, but you wrote that his real emotional difficulty did not come from trying to figure out if he was gay or straight. It came from his inability to truly trust anyone, male or female, on an intimate level. What drew you to him romantically? Oh, I just, I, I can't even put that to words either. I just loved him. I loved him and, and but I, I, I just never saw that in our future, but it felt like the very next normal thing to do, frankly, because we built this kind of great thing together in terms of my work. And, and when he proposed to me, I, I couldn't believe it, but I, I, it was really a hard decision, but I thought, I love him, and Michael is Michael, you know, and I would do anything at that moment to, I mean, say yes to him. Do you think the two of you were looking to be each other's family? Oh, perhaps. I mean, we had so much in common, but we were very different also. I think that we were trying to protect each other. It, the chorus line, um, it was epic. And I think there was a fear of letting go of each other in a certain way after working so intensely. I think there was great love there, but I think it was, I, and I, I share that opinion about myself. I think when I, when I described that about Michael, the, the fear of, of, of being emotionally that intimate you know, was something that I had to go into therapy and learn to overcome the, the need to trust the inner, the inner dependency of people that I didn't trust. And then Michael had his own fears. So I think we both brought that and that that made it very, you know, hard and a struggle for us. Now, obviously, you've given a lot of interviews about a chorus line, and I'm not going to bore you with questions you've answered a million times. But I think it's important, Donna, to clarify once and for all that although Michael Bennett created the role of Cassie specifically for you, 
Cassie was not exactly based on your life. You never did a toilet paper commercial. You no. never appeared as a singing Band-Aid. And Cassie no. felt that she wasn't a good actress. But I don't think you ever felt that way, did you? No. <laughs> no, I felt I, I always felt I had a lot to learn. I remember as that young girl in the in the 46th Street rehearsal room in How to Succeed saying, I have to learn how to act and sing because I would like to do this for a long time and be good at it. So, yeah. Well, so, I think the really great thing about your portrayal of Cassie is that she was so relatable for anyone hoping for yeah. a second chance. You didn't have to be a dancer to identify with her situation. Do you agree? That's what I discovered uh, met right after the show opened. The letters I would get from people who we didn't know how far reaching the metaphor was of that line of that character. Cassie was like the second chance character. And I related to that, that girl, that Cassie, that feeling like she was over the hill and everything coming back to work because she needed a job. But I, as Donna, I had, I, that wasn't me. Yes. That was somebody else that we patched together. But I have this, I, I relate to it a lot because I've been in situations where, well, not many, but enough to know that when you are desperate and you need a job to pay the rent, I know that feeling. So that was the great workshop. Uh, we did two workshops to develop not just, you know, all of these characters. There are five of the characters that are maybe developed a little more than the others, but it was all, you know, just kind of, seeing where, where we could, James Kirkwood and Nicholas Dante were very, you know, writing things and monologues and changing. And, and uh, it was really, I'm so happy that it worked out to be so such a, a show that so many people can relate to and it's still going on. Oh, and it always will. I mm -hmm. was fascinated to learn in your book that Michael Bennett's original vision for the ending of the show was that Cassie did not get the part. But Neil Simon and his wife, Marsha Mason, were the ones who convinced Michael that it would be much better to end the show on a positive note by having Cassie get the part. Isn't it great that Michael allowed himself to be convinced in that way? Oh, yes. Yeah. But see, that's what that was. That's what he did. That was so great. He was vulnerable enough. See, all of the real intimacy was in the work. I guess we're, we're that's what we're talking about. And he had a lot of trust and faith in Neil Simon, of course, because they worked together in Promises, Promises. And he had respect for Marsha Mason. And again, here we go where Michael is in this uh, process. He's trying to be honest and truthful. And he said to himself, if I was really faced with this dilemma, I would not hire her because she would remind me of failure every day I saw her because of her failure, uh, you know, out West. And, and I thought that that was a very honest, you know, maybe not a very attractive reaction, but that was his honest reaction. And then he was so close to the whole piece as we all were, that I think Neil and Marsha were able to be more objective and they saw the metaphor rising already where it was too depressing. You could feel it in the air when I didn't get the job. It wasn't that I didn't get the job. It was much more than that. Nobody wins. And Neil said, you know, he has to win and she has to win. So we all, it's, 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 it's got to have a positive. And Michael at first thought that was compromising. So that was a struggle. But yes, he did the right thing by being swayed. I think he did the right thing because the way the, the show goes the audience believes that Cassie deserves to get the part. She's that good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you think well, Michael we didn't Bennett... know that we were, we were too insular. You see, we were like, I called us hot house tomatoes. We were every day we'd go to the theater. It was a dark, you know, the Newman theater down at the Shakespeare festival, just a, no windows, just a dark black space on, with a stage and some, you know, seats. And we were there every day rehearsing, no mirrors really, except, you know, the back wall, which hadn't been built yet. And it, we just didn't know. We, we, we took it all very literally. Well, I'm do you think that Michael Bennett or Marvin Hamlish or any of you could have predicted the magnificent success no. 
that a chorus line had? No, no, no. I, I think Michael's instinct and Marvin's instinct and Ed's instinct and Cleban were, they had experienced a certain, you know, success. So they had a sense of what, what appealed to them. But Michael even said, I, I had no idea. I had no idea. But when I heard the, uh, the first song that we heard as a company from Marvin and Ed, it was at the ballet. When I heard them, Marvin sing that, I just went, oh my gosh, they really, that's the, the heartbeat of this show. It is now going from all text and kind of depressing stories of childhood. <laughs> now we're taking it into a whole different hemisphere with music, not just music, but the specific description of what it's like to be a dancer. And I just, I, I think everything changed, of course, with the music coming in and their songs. You know, Donna, I've always wondered whether being referred to as a triple threat is a bit of a mixed blessing. Do you think that being such a proficient dancer, singer, and actress made it difficult for directors to know how to categorize you as a performer? Well, I perhaps, I, I know it was kind of stuck in my brain a little bit that, in fact, I had to go to therapy so I wouldn't you know, uh, keep resenting my dancing because I, I, everyone, you know, they say pigeonholes, you, you know, you put, you know, they have to, for, for everyone's security, they had to know exactly who you are. So we, they can, and I wanted to be an actress without the dancing. I wanted to be seen in a different way. And I thought that the dancing was getting in the way. Of course, that's, that's silly, but it, that's how I felt at the time. And sometimes you have to uh, reach out beyond what people expect and, and create a new identity or create the demand is, is the way to put it. You create a demand for that different aspect of you. But you know, every time I did a play, I always missed the music. I always missed dancing, so. It's tough being so good at everything. <laughs> I, I want to ask you about Stephen Sondheim. You worked with him several times on Follies. You said he was a superb acting coach yeah. and he could have been a brilliant director if he had wanted to do that. He gave you an important piece of direction when you played Sally in Follies. He told you to recognize that you belonged on that stage. Why was that such an important thing to say to you? That's a very it's the first moment where a character appears on stage with the, in a singular way. And it, without dialogue, it had to be a feeling that, and an expression and a world that was very, you know, could be felt, but it was an inner ex experience walking on that stage. And he just remind, he said, this is where you belong. I can't remember these, you probably have it. He said, you're back. And this is where you, you know. And I, I just went, okay, now what, what he did actually is I have all that feeling. He gave me the green light to just be as what all, all we strive for in acting is to just be you know, make all of your specific choices and then just let it. It's that actor's trust that, that so many of my teachers talked about, just to be. And that, and that green light from him, because you know, me, I put him on a pedestal like so many people. I'm glad he gave you that advice. I'm glad that you conveyed that confidence to all of us. I now want to ask you about Donna McKechnie, the world famous choreographer. You've choreographed shows all over the world. So I have to ask you, are you the kind of choreographer that you would have liked to work with when you were a young dancer? Well, first of all, let me just say, it, it sounds like I've done a lot of, you know, shows, choreographing a lot of shows. I've done a, quite a few, but it's not something I ever, I, I, I never had ambition for it. So when a, when a certain job would come up or a certain someone would say, we have a, this wonderful little, you know, Leslie Corona is going to do six dance lessons in six weeks. Uh, would you like to choreograph it? And I said, oh, my God, yes, my idol. And I would take things that I felt I could really do 
And it wasn't on my list of, I have to be a choreographer. I, it was like a very, how do I explain it? If it's like Guys and Dolls at the Hollywood Bowl, when the director, Richard J. Alexander, asked me if I would be interested, I said, yes. Because that's, that's a language, that's an era that I know. And yeah, and I love the show so much. So you see, I, it, it, I did all these different kinds of things, but it was never something I pursued. In 1978, you received a devastating diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And after going on a very restrictive diet and learning about alternative medicine and the mind-body connection, you had an amazing recovery. You wrote in your book that you came to understand the emotional and psychological aspects of your arthritis. And you came to see the disease as a physical manifestation of the conflicts that you were carrying inside you. Donna, I just want to thank you for sharing that part of your journey with all of us, because I think your book has helped a lot of people going through the same thing you went through. Yeah, I hope so, because that's why I wrote it. And I I found out since then that it's not just arthritis that people meet that the challenge, you know, because I had to be very responsible because everybody's DNA, everybody's chemistry is different. So I can't put in the vitamins that I took, you know, every other day, or you you just can't do that. But I, the psychology of it is something that was relatable to enough people when they had other obstacles in their life, if not physical, emotional, if you have these unresolved conflicts and you can't express it or can't find the experience to resolve it, it, it has to go somewhere. So it goes in your body. That was my experience. And uh, it, 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 I had, uh, I just did a, a wonderful session with some theater people a few weeks ago. And I said, you, we have to grieve. When you're a dancer, you go to the bar every day and you do your plies and your tondo no matter how you feel. You just learn it's a discipline. You learn to push everything away and just rely on everything you know technically and just to do your bar so you always stay in shape. But little was was dealt with when I was growing up with what do you do with your emotional life? I think that's why I was so attracted to acting. But when I talked to this group, I said, you know, I lost, I call the litany of loss in that year of marriage, divorce, working, not working, having a home, not having a home, losing my father, which was a a shock to my system. And I never took the time to grieve. I just pushed myself forward in work and activity. And that was my downfall. Well, you said numerous times in your book that you suffered from poor self-esteem as a young woman. But there was an incident in company where Hal Prince wanted to cut one of your numbers called TikTok and you talked him out of it. So even though you were insecure, don't you think it took a great deal of confidence to approach Hal Prince in the way that you did? I'm embarrassed again. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I was uh, I felt desperate. It's it, it comes more from a survival thing than intellectual or let's see, how can I? you know, get on top of this situation and save my job. I was just desperate, like a, like an, like a lawyer arguing a case. I had been around too many people that had been and, and been in shows where my part was cut or, you know, then I was out of a job and I thought I've come too far. This can't happen. Uh, it was company. Everybody knew that company, everybody knew that it was a great show. We didn't, we didn't solve a lot of the problems in it yet, but, but I, it's Stephen Sondheim and Michael Bennett and Harold Prince and Elaine Stritch and this incredible score. And I thought I have to be a part of it. So I tried to talk my way. And this, this really says more about Hal Prince as a, as a great gentleman of the theater, because he said, okay, I'll fix it. And I said, I'm not leaving this stage until you t- promise me how. And he said, all right, I'll fix it. Now go up to the dressing room. It's half hour. And he fixed it. Anybody else might have just, I would have gotten my pink slip, you know. I, I, I just can't, I don't know where that came from, honestly. It wasn't, I don't know. I don't think it was courage. I think it was desperation. Well, it was desperation that you harnessed and manifested 
into okay. confidence, yeah. really. Now that's I very want nice of you to put it that way. <laughs> well, I'm no psychologist, but that's how I feel. I okay. want to read you something you wrote about your perfectionism. You said, I was always being so hard on myself. Nothing I did was ever really good enough. At home, after the show, I would go over that night's performance step by step before I could sleep, always trying to figure out how it could be better the next time. I couldn't leave myself alone. It was as if I wouldn't let myself enjoy the success I had worked so hard to achieve. Donna, did you eventually learn to enjoy your success? Yes, it took a long time <laughs> and lots of help, uh, lots of therapy. Yes, I, I, uh, the simple pleasures and the big joys of life and the success that we, we earn, and it's very gratifying. And it's another process, I guess, of, of learning how to live learning how to live and have a happy life. And as much as I love work, I just look back at that girl and the hard time I gave myself. And when I do talk to students now, I say to them sometimes, um, how many people here are overly critical ab about themselves? And the hands shoot up like this. Because dancers, you, you, you're, you're, asked to, you're asking your body to do things that, that aren't like uh, beyond our physical ability and we're uh so we have to it's it's never going to be perfect so we're always reaching for that so we get a little distorted in our thinking but thank you so much for bringing that very important point up because it it's so important for young people in training to allow themselves to make mistakes because that's when you make great strides to learn, to be open. You don't have to have the answer, whether you're in theater or in any other occupation, right? In life, you do not have to have the answer all the time. Well, like I said, I'm no psychologist, but it, it just seemed to me when I was reading your book, which I can't praise enough, as a young woman, your identity was so strongly connected to your ambition and your career yeah. success and not enough on who you were as a person. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, that's another part of my, my teaching when I'm able to. I try to pass that on that everything starts here with you. Your relationship between you, know, you and yourself is so important to love yourself. This, this, you've heard this a million times maybe, but to really appreciate it when you start loving yourself, you have great clarity in seeing the world and seeing everybody around you in a much more clear way. And you're not projecting onto people all of the, 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 the troubles that you are experiencing, but you can't find a, you know, an expression. Well, you wrote in the book that after many years of working on yourself, you learned to go where the love is. What did you mean yeah. by that? That's where, yes, it starts here. And you go where you are appreciated. Andre de Shields, I think in his Tony speech, said it in a different way. And it was quite wonderful about, you know, go to the people that when you see, what, how did he express it? I'm going to get it wrong. But it was like, be with people whose eyes light up when they see you. People well, you're with one of those people right now. Yeah. <laughs> Harvey, that's so nice. But, you know, yes, you, you, create, you create from a loving place. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not, you know, you don't work hard. You just don't work, you know, you just don't beat yourself up about it. You just keep making the effort. And another one of my favorite things to, to say is the art is in the effort. It's how you have to have all the training and all the, you know, the knowledge, but then what effort does it take to, to accomplish something, you know, in your work? You don't have to go home and go over every word, every syllable, every move, every nuance before you can go to sleep, you know? Well, in 1985, after nine years away from a chorus line, you returned to the show to go on tour in the U.S. and Japan. And then you returned to play Cassie on Broadway for eight months. And you did a chorus line in Paris and in several national tours. You yeah. wrote that this time, after having done so much work on yourself in therapy, you had a very different approach to playing Cassie because you created the character from the outside in 
as well as from the inside out. What did you mean by that? Well, I had a, a, you know, it's 10 years later. I am more of a a whole person, you know. Um, I'm not fragmented like I was, but all of my passion that went into the the show and everything I was able to use then, I was able to access 10 years later, but then have an overview and objectivity of it where I could leave the part in the dressing room. Do you know what I mean by that? Well, I think... You give, I, you give everything and then you go to the dressing room and then you go to dinner with your friends and you have a great celebration of love and friendship and enjoying the show and, and job. You know what it is? It's just Bob Fosse had this concept of the highest compliment he could give anyone, as Gwen told me, was you did it. It's like patting yourself on the back and saying job well done. Nothing more just job well done. And that was the great feeling that I wanted to have for so many years and, and relax and, and and see the world and uh, share the world in, in uh, so many ways. Well, you weren't living in anxiety. Like when you first played Cassie, you had an emotional distance from the role, a healthier relationship with, with your job. That's right. Exactly. True. Now, you wrote something very profound about what it's like to be in show business. This really moved me, Donna. You said, I have tried over the years to be a realist about show business disappointments. It's a business that is built on daily rejections and insecurity. You have to learn to just let it go, walk away, and look forward to the next opportunity, like walking away from a bad audition. Donna, is that the advice you give to young people hoping to pursue a career in show business? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And even walking away from a good audition, you know, because we don't always know when we get, why we get the job, if it's because we're the best or, or, you know, we don't know. So you have to, and Bob Fosse would say this to us as a company, don't compete with anyone else. You know, if you, if you want to do it better, then do it better. And not just on stage, but as a person, get up every morning and say, how can I become a better person? He uh, he just he was like a great um, his last production. That's the last time we saw him. He gave this great speech to all of us. And it was more like a father than a director. But, yes, I love to say pass that on and say you just let it go next because you'll drive yourself crazy worrying about what you should have done you know, what could I have done better? Well, that's not a bad one. Think about what you could have done better because we make our choices, we go in there and then we can't always judge also. So forget it next. Okay, Donna, I I want you to sit back and just listen to some of these highlights from your life. Just listen to this. Okay. You've worked with legendary stars like Jeanette McDonald, Gordon McRae, Ginger Rogers, Howard Keel, Ethel Merman, Angela Lansbury, Ann Miller, Elaine Stritch, Betty Buckley, Bernadette Peters, Glenn Close, and Billy Crystal. You've choreographed two of your idols, Cheetah Rivera and Leslie Caron. You did a director's workshop with Lee Strasberg. On your birthday in 1975, you had drinks with Sir Lawrence Olivier, Uh, who told you how much he loved you in Chorus Line. Fred Astaire came to see you in a Chorus Line in L.A. and took you and Michael Bennett for dinner at Trader Vic's in Beverly Hills. And then you went back to his home for drinks. You attended a party at the home of Jimmy Stewart, where you met Rosalind Russell, Merle Oberon, Billy Wilder and Jack Lemmon. Uh, you appeared on the Craft Music Hall 7th Anniversary Special with Bob Hope, and you sang Long Ago and Far Away, which I will never forget. You've performed at the White House for President Clinton, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Are there times when you have to pinch yourself to believe that you've actually experienced all of that? I think I'm pinching myself right now, actually. <laughs> no, it's, I, that's amazing. I, I, I know. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I've had the greatest luck. I mean, it's been hard work and that's what it takes, but, and talent, but, but I've been so blessed, you know, and be, have these opportunities and to be, to be able to meet some of my, 
my great, uh, you know, favorite stars. I mean, it's like I become speechless. I've tried to like grow up a little in that way, but I, I've just, they're, they're fantastic people, just so, so many fantastic people. And then to be able to work with them, you get to meet them in a whole different way. And it's very, uh, it's wonderful. Well, I only have one more question for you, Donna. When you look at how far you've come, having survived all those years of struggle, low self-esteem, two marriages, two divorces, arthritis, many personal losses, and many spectacular great triumphs on the stage, have you had the career that you always envisioned for yourself? Oh, yes, and, and more. I, I, I couldn't have envisioned this. When I just as we're talking, I'm going, wow, I hope I was present enough to really appreciate it. And because I really do that, you know, the, the list that you're 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 going on about it's it's fantastic. I, I could have never envisioned all of the wonderful things or the the, you know, life meeting you head on with some very difficult times. It, it's part of and from where I'm sitting now and I'm a lot older. It's still exciting. Every day is a new opportunity and things are still happening in my life that amaze me and delight me and things that are happening that are, are disappointing and, and frightening too. You know, the, the anxiety for certain, I mean, it's not just all show business now. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a life. And what I do love is that when you get old enough, you, if you're able to live as long as I have so far, you learn to appreciate the wisdom that you've been able to glean along the way and, and take it all in stride. And as my friend Carol Cook, you know, who just turned 98, you know, Carol, I'm sure yes. she might have done this show. If she hasn't, she should, because she would love it. She just, you know, keeps, you know, has a great sense of humor about herself. And, and that's how she's survived so well, I think. Not to take yourself so seriously, but to be serious about the things you do. Well, Ms. Donna McKechnie, I must tell you that it's been a huge honor to interview you. Thank you so much for all the so joy far, you've me. brought to the world <laughs> throughout your whole career. And thank Thanks. you for so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, you made this a wonderful moment in my life right now. Thank you, Harvey. That was really wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. That means the world to me. Take care. You too. All the best. Our guest has been the spectacular Donna McKechnie. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.